everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you have never seen my face on your screen before then hi my name is molly and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for then please do subscribe and don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that youtube will let you know whenever i post a new video this week we are going to be talking about a solved case from the state of michigan when a young woman just suddenly disappeared from her place of work one night in 2013 the police set out to try and establish exactly what had happened to her and evidence at the scene seemed to suggest that foul play was involved here but yet it wouldn't be until years later following an attempted abduction when evidence finally seemed to link someone to her case and also to the murder of a second woman and with that came the sickening realisation that this twisted predator was a serial offender, possibly even a serial killer. But quickly before we get into the case, please listen carefully to the following. This video is about the murders of two young women and involves heavy themes such as violence towards women, domestic abuse, sexual assault, as well as child pornography and pornography depicting the assault and torture of women. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back over a decade now to the spring of 2013 in Norton Shores which is a city located in Muskegon County in the state of Michigan in the US and this is Jessica Herringer. She was a young woman who lived in Muskegon County. Jessica was 25 years old at the time that this case took place. She was born on the 16th of July 1987 to her parents Pete Kankins and Shelley Herringer and Jessica was was one of three children. She had two sisters and their names were Samantha and Angel. Growing up, Jessica was described as always being a very, very intelligent young girl. Her sister said that she absolutely excelled in school because she was just naturally very bright. She was one of those students that didn't necessarily have to revise too much for her exams because she was so smart that she would have gotten a good grade regardless of whether she had studied or not. And I believe she was particularly particularly very good at maths. She really enjoyed maths, so much so that she had dreams of becoming an accountant when she was older. However, Jessica's life ultimately took a little bit of a different turn when she was in her early 20s and she met a man named Dakota. They were both employees at this restaurant, the same restaurant when they met and they eventually started dating and they fell in love. Jessica just fell head over heels for Dakota. And by the time this case occurred in 2013 the couple were actually engaged. Dakota had asked Jessica to marry him and she said yes. And as well as that they were also parents too. They had a three-year-old son named Zevin who Jessica just absolutely adored. Jessica's family said that when Zevin came along it was like everything changed for Jessica. He just became her entire world and she was described as being an incredible mother to her son. She was so loving and attentive. She would always read to Zevin and play with him. She was very passionate about teaching him to have good manners from an early age. She just thrived as a mum and it's clear that she would have done absolutely anything for that little boy. Anything to give him the best life that she possibly could. Jessica always remained very close to her family, to her mother and her sisters. According to a documentary that I watched about this case, they would often enjoy going to the beach together with her son Zevin as I think they all lived relatively close by or at least that was until in the year before this case occurred because her mother Shelley and one of her sisters Samantha actually moved out of Norton Shores where Jessica lived. Samantha moved to the state of Florida and their mum moved to another area which was about an hour and a half away from Norton Shores and Jessica found this very difficult to deal with. She was so used to always having her mum and Samantha close by and now they had moved away. So obviously she wasn't going to be able to see them as much. Of course they still kept in regular contact, they often spoke on the phone, but yeah she found it hard being so far away from two of the most important people in her life. But you know she got on with it, she kept herself busy with obviously her son Zevin and also her job. You see Jessica worked in a gas station, she worked at the Exxon gas station on Sternberg Road in Norton 
shores and she was honestly the perfect employee. I think she'd been working at the gas station for quite a while so she was very familiar with the job and very familiar with all of the regular customers and she was very popular with the customers because you know she was very friendly and chatty so they all loved her and actually working at the gas station is exactly what Jessica Herringer had been doing on the day that this case took place. The date was the 26th of April 2013. It was a Friday and that Friday evening as I said Jessica was working. She was working a night shift at the gas station. She was actually working there on her own that night. She was the only employee in the store. I can imagine that during the late night shifts there weren't too many customers about so I guess they didn't necessarily need more than one person working. And Jessica was used to working alone, used to working the night shift and used to closing the gas station. The store closed at 11.30pm. So she would have been of course tending to the customers but leading up to closing she also would have been cleaning the shop, getting it ready for the following day. So yeah that is what she would have been doing that night. At approximately 11.07pm that evening, so about 23 minutes before closing, one of the gas station's regular customers, a man named Craig Harpster, he pulled onto the forecourt, grabbed the petrol pump and attempted to fill up his vehicle with gas. However, he was unable to. You see, I think at most, if not all gas stations, an employee inside of the store usually has to authorise the petrol pump and turn it on so that it can actually be used, so that petrol will come out of it. But Craig was standing there waiting for someone to activate the pump and no one did. So he put the pump down and he walked inside of the gas station and there was no one behind the counter. In fact, there was no one in the entire store. He was walking around calling out saying, hello, is anyone here? But nothing, he got no response. And so he walked towards the back of the store to the stock room where obviously only employees are allowed to go. I think he kind of poked his head around the door to see if anyone was in there, but again, there was Following this, Craig walked towards the counter where the till or cash register was and he noticed that the cash register was open slightly. It didn't appear as though any cash had been taken out of it, the money was still in there but yeah, as I said, it had just been left open. So this just all seemed very bizarre, the fact that there was no one in the store and that the cash register had been left open. It just seemed so strange. And remember, Craig was a regular customer of this gas station and this had never happened before. So he just had this gut feeling that something was not right here. And so he decided to call 911. And he basically said to the operator something along the lines of, look, I'm not sure if this is even an emergency or not, but I'm at this gas station and there's no employee here and it just seems very odd and suspicious. So following this, this 911 call, a police officer was sent down to the Exxon gas station. They spoke to Craig and then this officer took a look around the station himself just to double check that there definitely wasn't anyone there and sure enough there wasn't. And so they decided to get in touch with the owner of the store and the manager was asked to go down to the gas station to meet with police. Her name was Sue and Sue told the police that one of her employees, 25 year old Jessica Herringer, was supposed to be working that night. She was supposed to be closing the store, but I guess it seemed as though she had just left for some reason. Although that seemed very unlikely that Jessica would have just left because, well, number one, she was a very reliable employee. So it didn't seem likely that she would have just decided to go and not let anyone know, not let her manager know, and also not close the cash register and lock the doors. But also, another reason why that seemed very unlikely that Jessica would have just left of her own accord was because all of her belongings still seem to be there. Her purse was just left by the cash register, her jacket was in the stock room, and also her car was still parked outside. So wherever she had gone, she'd either left on foot or someone had picked her up, or perhaps something more sinister had happened to Jessica. 
what if this was an abduction? So after realising that Jessica was missing, the police quickly got in touch with her partner, Dakota, to find out if she was with him. Maybe he picked her up from the gas station or something. However, it turns out that that wouldn't have really been possible because Jessica and Dakota shared a car. They had one car between them. And obviously Jessica had used it to get to work that night. And they also shared a cell phone, which Dakota had at the house with him. So Jessica would have had no way of contacting her fiance or anyone really. But anyway, the police told Dakota what the situation was and they asked if Jessica was with him. Had he seen her? And he said no. He said that the last time he saw his fiance was when she left for work earlier that day. So of course Dakota was very concerned and he decided to head to the gas station too. And concern for Jessica only grew when the police actually found traces of blood at the scene. As more police officers were dispatched to the scene and they started conducting a very thorough search of the gas station, they noticed some blood. A little blood stain outside by the back of the gas station and when this blood was later tested it was found to have been a match to Jessica Herringer. So this blood was very alarming. I mean it wasn't a huge amount of blood that they found, it really was just like a rather small patch but it was Jessica's and she was missing so had she been attacked that night had she really been abducted and she was somehow injured during a violent struggle with her attacker whilst they were trying to I don't know force her into a vehicle or something one theory that emerged pretty quickly in the case was that perhaps Jessica was attacked while she was trying to take out the trash that evening obviously she was closing the store that night so she would have been tidying up and cleaning and the gas station's trash can was discovered right by the back door as if Jessica was about to take it outside. So maybe literally as she opened the back door to take out the trash that was when she was attacked and abducted. So in an effort to work out what time the attack may have happened the police tried to put together a timeline of events. They obviously knew from Craig Carpster that he arrived at the gas station and found it empty just over 20 minutes before closing time at 11.07 p.m. And the last transaction on the cash register, the last sale that Jessica made was at 10.55 p.m. when a customer came into the store and they purchased a cigarette lighter. And I believe this customer was soon identified. It was a woman and she was ruled out as a suspect in the investigation. So whatever had happened to Jessica must have happened within that very short amount of time. There were just 12 minutes between that last sale of the lighter and Craig Carpster arriving at the gas station just 12 minutes. So what happened during those 12 minutes? Well, Sue, the manager of the store, she was able to provide the police with a potential clue. You see, it turns out that Sue and her husband had actually driven past the gas station at around 11 p.m. So just five minutes after the last transaction. And Sue noticed something strange when she glanced over at the store. She noticed that there was what looked like a silver van, a minivan, just parked by the back of the store rather than on the forecourt. And she thought that this was strange because usually the only people who would park by the back of the store were the delivery drivers when they were dropping off stock for the gas station. But that only happened in the daytime. The gas station never had deliveries this late at night. So Sue thought that it was odd that there was a silver minivan parked there. And so Sue and her husband decided to pull up near the gas station and just kind of observe what was going on for a minute or so because Sue was actually worried that maybe this was a robbery attempt or something. So they just waited and watched and they saw that the back of the van was open. The rear hatch was open and a man, the driver, walked around to the back of the van and he shut the back door. And some sources state that he did this a few times. He would close the door and then 
open it again and look as though he was kind of moving something around in there and then he would shut it once more. Sue and her partner weren't close enough to see what it was, what he was moving in the van, but when he closed the trunk for the final time, they observed him getting into the vehicle and driving away. And he actually drove right past Sue as he left. So Sue and her husband got a fairly good look at his face. And also the van, they were watching this guy and his vehicle for a good few minutes, I think. And they later told the police that they strongly believed that the van was a silver Chrysler town and country minivan. Sue also described how she recalled the driver having, quote, wild blonde hair. And I think what she meant by that was that it was quite scruffy looking. Maybe the reason for that, the reason why his hair looked very scruffy was because this man was Jessica's attacker and perhaps during the struggle she tried to grab at his hair. Maybe the thing that this man was seen moving around and adjusting in his van was Jessica, her body. Now a composite sketch was later made of the driver with Sue's help with her description of him and it was eventually released to the public. So that is the image on screen right now. So now the police had, I guess, their first proper lead. They had a description of their suspect and a description of his vehicle. They strongly believed that this man seen by the back of the gas station that night had to have had something to do with Jessica's disappearance. And when sniffer dogs were brought down to the gas station, what they detected just confirmed this theory even more for the police because they were brought in to track Jessica's scent and they alerted police that her scent ended its stopped right by the back of the store where Sue and her husband saw the silver minivan. So in an effort to trace the minivan and hopefully get an image of the license plate because that was one thing that Sue and her husband didn't have a chance to take note of that night. They didn't jot down the number plate. The police asked Sue if they could have the CCTV footage from the gas station that evening but Sue said no. The reason being because the gas station didn't have have CCTV cameras installed. Frustratingly, the owners never installed any, which was incredibly disappointing for the police, as you can imagine. And so instead, they started asking all of the local businesses that were around or near the gas station if they could have a look through their surveillance footage from that night to see if maybe they could spot a van that matched the description of the van that Sue saw. And sure enough, they did. They obtained the footage from one business which was on a road next to Sternberg Road where the gas station was and at approximately 11.05 p.m. so just a couple of minutes after Sue saw the driver at the gas station a silver minivan was seen on this footage driving along the road and some sources state that this same minivan was also captured on a couple of other businesses CCTV cameras driving along this same road too after Jessica disappeared so the police believe that Jessica was inside of that van. But although this CCTV footage of the van was a huge piece of evidence, unfortunately, it just was not clear enough to get a good image of the license plate. The footage was a bit grainy and obviously it was late, so it was dark outside. So yeah, they still did not have the license plate. The footage did indeed confirm what Sue thought, that it was a Chrysler town and country van. But the issue was this was not a unique vehicle at all. In fact, I think this type of minivan at the time was one of the most popular. There were literally thousands and thousands and thousands of them in the state of Michigan alone. So trying to narrow down who the perpetrator could have been through looking at who owned one of these vans was going to be near enough impossible for the police because so, so, so many people had them. So that was another setback. Meanwhile, as all of this was going on, as detectives were focusing on searching for the van, Jessica's loved ones were doing absolutely everything that they could to help search for her and find answers. They created flyers and missing posters with Jessica's picture on and they distributed them around the area. They spoke on different TV news channels and appealed to the public for information. Jessica's mother, Shelley, even did a heartbreaking plea to Jessica's attack 
attacker. Whoever he was, she just pleaded to him to please let her daughter go because she's a mother herself. Her three-year-old son, Zevin, was waiting for his mummy to come back. Just anything that the family could do to help spread awareness of Jessica's disappearance, they were doing. They were absolutely determined to find her and bring her home. As was Jessica's fiance, Dakota. He was also appearing on the news, appealing for information, doing everything that he could to try and find his partner. Although Dakota was looked at quite extensively by the police as a person of interest in her case. Obviously, because he was the partner, the police had to look into him. And what they discovered as they did this was that Dakota and Jessica's relationship was actually on the rocks at the time of her disappearance. They were engaged to be married, but actually they weren't really that happy together anymore, or at least Jessica didn't appear to be happy. Apparently they had had some financial troubles, which I can imagine put a strain on their relationship, them struggling for money. And Jessica in particular had a lot of pressure on her shoulders to bring in the money for her family because Dakota didn't actually work. He was unemployed. I believe I read on one source that he had recently lost his job. So I don't know if he was in the process of looking for a new one, but yeah, Jessica was the main breadwinner of the household, I suppose. She had to work a lot of hours at the gas station to provide for Dakota and their son. But as well as that, it seems as though Jessica took on the majority of household chores as well. According to her family, she was the one who would have to do the cleaning. She was the one who went out food shopping. She was the one who did all of the laundry. Dakota didn't really do any of that and he was the one who didn't work. Jessica was working all these hours and she still had to come home and do all of the chores. So as you can imagine, this put a strain on their relationship. It took a toll on Jessica and she would actually write a lot about her thoughts and feelings about her relationship with Dakota in her journal. I have a quote here from her journal. She wrote, he makes me so angry all the time. He's so selfish and lazy. That's what really gets to me. He comes home and does absolutely nothing. Jessica also wrote things in her diary which made it quite clear that she felt as though a lot of aspects of her life were controlled by Dakota. He could apparently be quite controlling when it came to money. Even though she was the one who brought in the money, it was him who would control it and I suppose decide what they would spend it on. He would be controlling when it came to the people that Jessica would hang out with, which of her friends he would allow her to see or message on the phone that they shared. And in one journal entry, Jessica even wrote about how on one occasion, Dakota had been violent towards her and how their three-year-old son witnessed this. So yes, overall, her relationship was really at a breaking point, I think. And of course, after learning all of this, the police became very suspicious of Dakota. However, they were ultimately able to pretty much rule him out completely as having anything to do with what had happened to Jessica. He told the police that on the night of her disappearance, he was at home with Zevin all evening. He never left the house. He said that he couldn't have left the house, even if he wanted to, because if you recall from earlier on in the video, he and Jessica shared a car and she had driven the car to work that night. And also his phone data from that night proved that his story was true. They were able to trace the location of his phone and it stayed in the area where he and Jessica lived all night. So that seemed to rule him out. The police did look into a couple of other men in Jessica's life, men that were known to often go and see her and chat to her while she was working in the gas station. There was even one guy, one friend of Jessica's, who claimed that he fell in love with her despite being already married himself. And he said that he went to visit her at the gas station at around 9.30 p.m. on the night that she went missing. So he was thoroughly looked into to as a potential suspect. But again, there was never any evidence to link him or any other acquaintance of Jessica's to her disappearance. As part of this missing persons inquiry, a task force was set up of several police officers and even some detectives with the FBI. They were all going to be working together solely on Jessica's case. By this point, the police had released the composite sketch of the suspect and they'd also released the information about the silver minivan to the public. 
it. And as a result of this, they did receive numerous calls with potential tips and leads. Many people would ring up and say, oh, I think the composite looks like this person or it could be this person. But again, the police could never obtain the evidence that they needed to connect to anyone to the crime. And soon, days without any sign of Jessica turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and months turned into a whole year. In April of 2014, it had been an entire year and Jessica was still missing. Although it was in early 2014 when a new potential suspect emerged in Jessica's case. It was a man named Brad Mason and Brad Mason was a convicted sex offender. He had spent time in prison before for crimes such as indecent exposure and rape as well as assault and breaking and entering and he was eventually released from prison in October of 2012 according to news articles. However, it wasn't long before he reoffended, and he became a suspect in the kidnapping and sexual assault of a 24-year-old woman in Kalamazoo, which is a city in Michigan. This woman was just walking along the road one evening. She was on her way to her boyfriend's house when all of a sudden a man literally grabbed her from behind and he dragged her into his pickup truck, which was parked nearby, and he kept this poor woman in that truck for literally hours. He held her hostage for hours and during this time he repeatedly sexually assaulted her and he also told her multiple times during this horrific ordeal that she wouldn't make it out of this alive, that he was going to murder her. I mean, can you even imagine the fear that she must have felt thinking that this was it. This man was going to end her life that night in a horrific way. But thankfully, by some miracle, he actually didn't. For some reason, he actually decided to let her go and she contacted the police. And in February of 2014, convicted sex offender Brad Mason was identified as being the perpetrator and the police went to his house to arrest him. However, this arrest would not go to plan because it turns out that there was essentially a standoff between Brad Mason and the police officers because as he opened his front door, as officers approached his house, they noticed that he was holding a gun. What officers didn't know at the time was that this gun was actually fake, but the officers were shouting at him, ordering him to drop the gun immediately, drop his weapon now, but he didn't. Brad refused and so, fearing for the safety of the public and their own safety, the officers had no choice but to shoot Brad Mason themselves. He was shot dead on his doorstep. Following Brad Mason's death, the detectives in Kalamazoo who'd been investigating the abduction and rape of the 24-year-old woman, they decided to look into the possibility that perhaps Brad Mason could have been connected to other similar cases. And that was when they came across the case of Jessica Herringer in Norton Shores in Michigan. She was basically the same age as Mason's other victim, so she matched his victim type, and he did have a connection to Norton Shores, where Jessica lived and vanished from. Apparently, a couple of years earlier, he spent some time living in a halfway house in Norton Shores whilst he was on parole after being released from prison, and this halfway house was literally only a few miles away from the Exxon gas station. Now, I don't know if he was actually living in the halfway house at the time that Jessica disappeared in April of 2013 or if he had moved elsewhere by that point but sources state that he did have an acquaintance, a friend in Norton Shores so whether he still lived there or not he still had a reason why he might have gone back there. Maybe he went back to Norton Shores in April of 2013 to visit this friend and whilst there he decided to abduct a young woman and that young woman just happened to be Jessica but again, just like previous suspects in this case, the police were unable to obtain any concrete evidence to prove that Mason was involved in Jessica's disappearance. And obviously, because
because he was now deceased, it wasn't like they would ever get a confession out of him or anything. And so over the next few years, I think he remained a solid suspect in the case because they couldn't really find anything that could definitively rule him in or rule him out. Or at least he remained a top suspect in the case until 2016. So three years after Jessica's disappearance, when again, another person of interest emerged in the case following yet another abduction. In April of 2016, a 16-year-old girl was walking along a road in Muskegon County in Michigan after having left a party that she was attending. She was walking home from this party and as she was walking, a vehicle pulled up alongside her and the driver, a man, asked her if she wanted a lift home. He didn't mind giving her a ride and she said, yes, please. According to some sources, this girl was actually a bit lost. I think she was struggling to find her way home. So I'm sure she would have been so grateful when this stranger pulled over and offered to help her. However, as it would turn out, that was not this man's intention at all. And once this young girl was in his car, he immediately threatened her with a gun and started driving away. But this girl was so brave and she knew the danger that she was in. She knew that she had to get out of this vehicle. She couldn't let this man drive her away. And so as he was driving, I think she quickly opened the passenger side door or the window and she literally jumped out of the moving car and began running as fast as she could away from her abductor's vehicle. She ran towards the home of a woman named Dawn Schmidt and at the time Dawn was just sitting on the decking outside of her house drinking coffee when she saw this teenage girl sprinting towards her shouting and screaming for help. So Dawn brought her inside and they immediately called the police to report this young girl's horrific ordeal. So now the police had an attempted abduction on their hands and they set out to find the man that had tried to kidnap this young girl. She described her attacker as best as she possibly could to the police. She also described his vehicle as best as she could. She actually said that it was a silver minivan. So according to one article, the police looked at CCTV footage from around the area where the abduction took place and sure enough, they spotted a silver minivan. And when they looked up the license plate, they found that the owner of the van was 47 year old Jeffrey Willis. And so they took a picture of Jeffrey Willis to the 16 year old victim and they showed it to her as part of a photo lineup to see if she would pick Jeffrey out as being her attacker. And sure enough, she did. She identified him as being the man who abducted her straight away. So Jeffrey Willis was immediately arrested and as part of their inquiries, the police conducted a search of both his home and his vehicle, the silver minivan, and what they found in there just completely shocked the police. They discovered items such as a ball gag, syringes with a sedative drug in them, restraints like ropes and handcuffs. It seemed as though all of these things were a part of some kind of kidnapping kit or rape kit which just made what happened to that 16 year old girl seem even more sinister. Her abduction wasn't a one-off. It wasn't like Jeffrey Willis was just driving around that day when he spotted her walking along the road and decided in the spur of the moment to kidnap her. What the police found in his vehicle made it clear that her abduction was premeditated. He was probably driving around that evening looking for someone that he could kidnap and his intention was to use these items to sexually assault and torture and who knows, possibly even kill that young girl. But that wasn't all that they found. When they searched his electronic devices, his computer, they found a load of incredibly violent pornography, which included images of women who had been tied up with chains, videos of women being sexually assaulted and tortured, even killed. There were videos of necrophilia. I think most of these videos were fake but some of them were. Some of them were real. He'd obviously obtained them through the dark web or something. And there was also child pornography on his computer. And I also read in one article that as well as this, the police found literally thousands and thousands of videos that Jeffrey Willis had recorded himself of young teenage girls at high school swim meets. He was filming these children without their knowledge whilst they were in their swimming costumes. So this man 
was a real creep, a paedophile and a sexual predator, a real danger to women and children. He was soon charged in relation to the attack on the 16 year old girl. He was charged with kidnapping and assault with a dangerous weapon. And it was following his arrest and the discovery of all of this horrific evidence when the police started to think surely the abduction of that teenage girl wasn't the first crime that he had committed. What if there were other victims of Jeffrey? Willis out there? What if he had committed other attacks and he just hadn't been linked to them yet? In fact, they started to wonder if maybe Jeffrey Willis was the one who was responsible for the unsolved disappearance of Jessica Herringer, which happened a couple of years earlier. The main reason being because of his van. He had a silver minivan which matched the description of the van that was seen at the gas station on the night that Jessica vanished, the van that had never been found. Found. But before we delve further into that theory that Jeffrey Willis was involved in Jessica's case, let me just tell you a little bit more about who this man was, a bit of background information on Jeffrey Willis. So Jeffrey Willis was born on the 6th of March 1970 and as far as I'm aware he had a pretty normal childhood, normal upbringing. He came from a very middle class family. He was one of five children, he had four brothers and he attended the Fruitport High school in Michigan before graduating in 1988. And following this, he went on to go to college where he studied history, I believe. And in school, he was described as being a very popular guy, to be honest. He had a lot of friends and he was intelligent, although apparently he could be quite arrogant and full of himself at times. And one girl that Jeffrey Willis went to school with has since come forward and she claimed that one night she and Jeffrey Willis were in his car, I believe. They were part up and they started making out and it was clear that Jeffrey Willis wanted to go further and do more than just kiss but this girl said no she didn't want to do anything else and apparently this made Jeffrey Willis angry. He was annoyed at her for telling him to stop and he got so angry that this girl spent the whole ride home scared. She felt fearful of him until he eventually dropped her back to her house. Willis eventually got married and he and his wife had a daughter together. However, tragically, his wife died in a car crash. And in 2003, he married another woman named Charlene and they were married for about 13 years. But I've jumped ahead a little bit there because a couple of years before he married Charlene, in 1999, Jeffrey Willis was actually working in a school. He worked in an elementary school as a janitor. However, he was fired from this job when it was discovered that he was using the school computers to access porn. So he was, of course, immediately sacked. And how disturbing is that? The fact that he was watching porn whilst he was working in a school. Some sources even state that he showed this porn to one of the children. Following this, I believe he eventually got a job working as a factory worker or something. And he was, for the most part, able to portray himself as this normal family man, I suppose. He didn't have a criminal record, so he wasn't known to the police. He just seemed like a normal guy. But little did people know just how dangerous and predatory Jeffrey Willis was. As I mentioned earlier, he kept a load of violent pornography and child pornography stored on his computer. He would secretly film teenage girls at swimming meets. I believe I read that he would record his neighbours without their knowledge, record young women. Again, he was just a freaking creep of a man. But as we know, it wasn't until the spring of 2006 when he became a person of interest in the Jessica Herringer case after he attempted to abduct that 16 year old girl and the police realised that his silver minivan matched the description of the van that was seen at the gas station around the time that Jessica vanished. But it wasn't just Jessica's case that Jeffrey Willis now became a suspect in, he also eventually became a suspect in the murder of another woman. Her name 
name was Rebecca Bletch. She was a 36 year old woman who lived in Muskegon County in Michigan with her family. She was married, according to sources, her husband was called Kevin and she also had a daughter named Ellie and a stepdaughter named Megan. Rebecca worked in a nursing home as an assistant occupational therapist and she was described by her loved ones as being a true role model and quote, the life of the party. Rebecca was also a very active person, very sporty. She enjoyed being a coach for a middle school's girls basketball team in Muskegon County and she also enjoyed jogging, going out on a run, which is exactly what she had been doing on the day that she was killed. It was the 29th of June 2016 when Rebecca was just jogging along a road in Muskegon County. She was less than a mile away from her home when all of a sudden she was shot dead. She was shot three times in the back of the head in what police at the time believed was a drive-by shooting. A drive-by shooting which unfortunately went cold until Jeffrey Willis was arrested in 2016 because in his silver minivan alongside his torture and rape kit, they also discovered a gun. It was a 22 caliber semi-automatic handgun and ballistics were able to match this gun to shell casings that were found at the crime scene on the road where Rebecca was shot dead. It was Jeffrey Willis's gun that had been used to murder Rebecca. So the police now theorized that perhaps Jeffrey Willis pulled up alongside Rebecca as she was running and he threatened her with the gun and tried to force her into his vehicle but that she refused and so he decided to kill her there and then and then drive away. Although having said that, according to sources, other items found in Jeffrey Willis's van included a glove and a sex toy, both of which when later tested were found to have had Rebecca's DNA on them. So that indicated that at some point during the attack, Rebecca was likely sexually assaulted by the attacker. Perhaps she was assaulted after she had been shot, who knows? As well as this, they also found additional evidence linking him to Rebecca's murder on his computer because they discovered that he had a computer file on his hard drive that was labelled VIX. That was it, just VIX. It's believed that VIX was short for victims. And when the police opened this VIX file, there were two folders in there, one with the title RSB and the other was named JLH. And when they opened the RSB one, they found that inside of it, there were a load of pictures of Rebecca Bletch and also news articles relating to her murder. So it was clear to the police that the folder name RSB stood for Rebecca Sue Bletch and the other folder JLH stood for his other victim, Jessica Lynn Herringer. They were Jessica's initials. And again, inside of this folder, there were pictures of Jessica as well as online articles about her case. The police also found on his computer a password. And this password was J4L27H13, which again, the police believe stood for both Jessica's initials, JLH, and the numbers 4, 27, and 13, they theorized stood for the date of the day after Jessica Jessica vanished. She disappeared on the 26th of April 2013 and the police believe that these numbers in the password stood for the 27th of April 2013. So clearly this date had some meaning to Jeffrey Willis. Perhaps this was the day that he killed Jessica. She disappeared on the 26th, but maybe it was the 27th when she died. And although Jessica's body had never been found, the police now strongly believed that she was in fact dead and that Jeffrey Willis was the man who killed her. But whilst the police were still working on building their case against Jeffrey Willis for the death of Jessica Herringer, they went ahead and charged him with the murder of Rebecca Bletch, as well as an additional charge of possession of child pornography. He pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder in Rebecca's case, but ultimately the prosecution had enough evidence to prove to the jury that he was in fact guilty and he was convicted of her murder in November of 2017 and he was also found guilty 
of the use of a firearm in the commission of a felony. The sentence he received was life in prison without parole. And just as a side note, following Jeffrey Willis's trial for Rebecca's murder, in March of 2018, a new law named after Rebecca, called the Rebecca Bletch Law, was passed by the Michigan House of Representatives, which basically meant that it would be a legal requirement for convicted killers and criminals to listen to families of their victims give their victim impact statements at sentencing. Because Jeffrey Willis actually just outright refused to do this during his court proceedings for Rebecca's murder. He refused to listen to what her loved ones had to say. Unbelievably, at the time, he had the right to refuse, which, of course, absolutely enraged people. It made them so angry, including Rebecca's family. I have a quote here from Rebecca's sister, Jessica, and she said, a part of my grieving process was taken away Away from me in a horrible way. What is the point of an impact statement if I can't speak to the person who has impacted me and destroyed my family? No other family should have to feel their words and their heartache don't matter. Victims have a right to be heard and express their feelings to the individual that caused it. And this outrage surrounding this situation is what sparked the change in the law, Rebecca's Law, which, as I said, now means that convicted criminals have no choice but to listen to victim impact statements during court proceedings. It's just a shame that no such law was in place before Rebecca's trial because Jeffrey Willis managed to get out of hearing directly from her family. Although, I did read in one article that although he refused to listen to their statements in court, they were recorded and played back to him during his journey to prison. They were played over and over again. In the months after Jeffrey Willis was charged with Rebecca Bletcher's murder, the detectives investigating Jessica Herringer's disappearance continued trying to find evidence which linked him to her case, to her murder, because, as I said before, they now felt very confident that she was sadly deceased. However, of course, a no-body murder trial is very difficult for prosecutors. They were really going to need a substantial amount of evidence to prove, number one, that Jessica was in fact dead, and number two, that Jessica Jeffrey Willis was the one who killed her. So, so far, as we discussed earlier, they had the evidence that he owned a silver minivan, which looked exactly like the van that the manager Sue saw on the night that Jessica disappeared, and the van on the CCTV footage. And they also had the evidence from Jeffrey's computer, the password with Jessica's initials and the date of the day after she went missing, and the fact that he had a load of pictures of Jessica and news articles about Jessica case kept in a file labelled Vix for victims. I mean, let's be honest, all of that is pretty damning evidence in itself. But thankfully, it wasn't the only evidence that the police found. They also obtained evidence from Jeffrey Willis's cell phone records, which proved that Willis had been to the Exxon gas station on Sternberg Road several times in the lead up to Jessica's disappearance. So this showed that he knew the gas station well. He probably even got to know Jessica and the times that she was worked there. He would have known that she often did late night shifts alone, so perhaps he chose her as a victim for this very reason, because he knew that it would be easier to abduct her when there was no one else around. Sources also state that his cell phone records on the night of Jessica's disappearance showed that he was close to the gas station around the time of the abduction. Apparently, he spoke to his wife on the phone, and the location where he made this call was near to the crime scene. And as well as that, something which I haven't actually mentioned so far in this video is that when the police arrived at the gas station that night after receiving that initial 911 call from Craig Harpster, they actually found part of a handgun just outside of the gas station on the ground near where that patch of Jessica's blood was. And as it would turn out, the handgun that was later found in Jeffrey Willis's van 
had this exact same part missing from it. So the police believed that he used this handgun possibly to threaten Jessica that night and during a struggle part of it broke off or something. It's theorised that he used this gun to hit Jessica over the head and knock her unconscious before putting her in the back of his van. If you look at the composite sketch of the suspect, Jeffrey Willis looks pretty similar. I think he does anyway. I think he looks very similar so that was more circumstantial evidence. So now it was found that despite never having found Jessica they had obtained enough evidence to prove that she had been killed by Jeffrey Willis and so in September of 2016 he was officially charged. He was charged with her abduction and murder but actually he wasn't the only one to face charges in relation to Jessica's case. It turns out that Jeffrey's cousin, his name was Kevin Bloom, he was also charged. He was charged with lying to the police about the Jessica Herringer case and also so I believe about the Rebecca Bletch case. Kevin Bloom was a former prison guard at the Michigan Department of Corrections and when he was interviewed, I think following his cousin's arrest, unbelievably he actually told the detectives that he knew that Jessica Herringer was dead and that he knew that Jeffrey had killed her because he actually saw Jessica's body. Kevin Bloom said that the day after Jessica disappeared, his cousin, Jeffrey Willis, called him and told him to come to their late grandfather's house. Their grandfather had passed away a couple of years earlier and when he died, his house, which was on Bailey Street in Norton Shores, which I believe is only five to six miles away from the Exxon gas station on Sternberg Road, the house just remained in the family. It was never sold on and it just remained remained vacant but the family had access to it and this obviously included Jeffrey. Anyway, the day after Jessica went missing, Kevin Bloom claimed that his cousin called him and told him to come to their grandfather's house. Sources state that he told Kevin that he had a woman there and that they were going to have a party. So Kevin went to the house and he said that whilst there he went down to the basement and that was when he saw a blonde haired woman. She wasn't moving, she had been tied up, she was naked, and it was clear that she had been hit around the head. She had a very obvious head wound. He believed that this woman was Jessica Herringer, who Kevin Bloom told police Jeffrey Willis had basically been stalking for a while before she vanished. As we know from Jeffrey's phone records, he went to the Exxon gas station a number of times before Jessica's disappearance and Kevin said that Jeffrey had just been watching her and following her. He had clearly chosen Jessica to be his victim way in advance and of course she would have had absolutely no idea and when Willis kidnapped Jessica and he took her back to his grandfather's house, Kevin Bloom said that it was there where Willis essentially tortured her before her death. As we know, he tied her up. It's believed that he sexually assaulted her. It's unimaginable to think about what Jessica must have gone through in the lead up to her death. So Kevin Bloom literally saw Jessica's body in his grandfather's house knowing full well that his cousin had murdered her and yet he didn't call for help. He didn't call the police. Instead, he told the detectives that he actually helped his cousin get rid of Jessica's body. He apparently said that he felt forced to, maybe because Jeffrey was family and family loyalty comes first, I don't know. So he said that they wrapped Jessica's body up in a sheet and then drove her, he said, to an area on Sheridan Road in Muskegon County, an area not far from where Jeffrey himself lived and there they buried her. Now this area was searched by the police and they never found a body. They never found Jessica. So perhaps Kevin was lying about the location or he was mistaken, he forgot, who knows. I think it was very difficult for the police to get a proper like solid statement from him to be honest because he would constantly change his story. Kevin literally gave this basically confession to the police 
And then he just took it back. At the end of his interview, he recanted his statement and basically just said, oh, don't listen to anything I've just said. I was lying about all of that. He was trying to make out like, actually he didn't have anything to do with the case. It was like he made that confession, realized what he had said, that he had implicated himself. And so was just suddenly like, oh, actually I take it all back. But of course the police didn't believe that he wasn't involved. They firmly believed that his original story was true, that he saw Jessica's body in that basement and that he probably did help Jeffrey dispose of her remains. And so, as I said before, he was charged with lying to the police and also charged with accessory to murder. Well, accessory after the fact. And despite his initial denial, he ultimately pleaded guilty or pleaded no contest and he was sentenced to 476 days in prison plus five years probation afterwards and he would also have to wear a GPS tracker for at least a year. As for Jeffrey Willis, so as we know he was charged with Jessica's abduction and murder which he completely denied, he pleaded not guilty but the jury were able to see through his lies and in May of 2018 he was convicted of Jessica's murder and was again sentenced to life in prison without parole. He has tried to appeal his conviction I believe a couple of times but each time he has been unsuccessful and he remains in prison. To this day, more than a decade later, the remains of Jessica Herringer have never been located. Jeffrey Willis has never admitted what he did with her body, where he buried her, which is just awful for the family. Cases like this where it's solved but there's no body are just so heartbreaking because yes, the family have justice but they'll never have full closure. They'll never be able to properly process this because Jessica is still missing. She's still out there somewhere. They were never able to give her a proper burial. They don't have somewhere that they can go to be with Jessica and talk to her, which is just devastating. And I just hope that one day soon, Jessica's remains will be found so that her family will have that closure. But speaking of Jessica's family, in the aftermath of her disappearance, before Jeffrey Willis was even ever identified as as the top suspect in the case, they decided to try and make a change in the law in her name. A change surrounding businesses like convenience stores and gas stations having surveillance cameras installed on their property. Because if you remember from earlier on in the video, the Exxon gas station where Jessica worked and was abducted from did not have any CCTV cameras installed. And if they had, let's be honest, it probably would have made the investigation into Jessica's disappearance a hell of a lot easier for the police to solve. They probably would have found Jeffrey Willis way sooner because perhaps if the gas station had cameras, they would have been able to get an image of his van's license plate. Maybe they would have even found him before he could go on to commit his second murder in 2014, the murder of Rebecca Bletch. And Jessica's family just felt that it was so wrong for businesses like gas stations not to have CCTV cameras installed, especially if they are going to have a young woman like Jessica working there on her own late at night. And so they began campaigning for Jessica's law, which would make it a legal requirement for shops and gas stations that are open at night to have to have surveillance cameras installed and also to have at least two employees working during night shifts. Although I don't actually know for certain whether this law was ever passed, some sources state that it was passed by Michigan State Legislature in March of 2020, whereas others state that it hasn't officially been passed or introduced yet. So I'm not really sure what's accurate there. If anyone watching is able to shed some light on that, please do leave a comment down below. But another thing that happened in the aftermath of Jessica's case is that her family, so her mother and sisters, went to court against Jessica's fiance Dakota over the custody of Jessica and Dakota's son, Zevin, as the family felt that they would be able to raise him better than Dakota and in the way that Jessica always intended to raise Zevin. 
Zevon. And at the end of this custody battle, custody of Zevon was awarded to Jessica's sister, Samantha. So he has spent the past decade being raised by his auntie. And that concludes this case. That is the case of Jessica Herringer, Rebecca Bletch, and their evil killer, Jeffrey Willis. It is speculated that Jeffrey Willis may have had even more victims than the two that we've talked about. He may have been a serial killer. In particular, it's been theorised that he may have been responsible for the murder of a 15-year-old girl named Angela Marie Thornburg. Now, she was a student at the same high school that Jeffrey Willis attended, and she disappeared and was killed in late 1996. So Jeffrey would have been around his mid-20s at the time, I think, and a lot of people suspect that Angela may have been his first victim, or one of his first victims. However, as I understand it, there has never been sufficient evidence to charge him with the crime, and unfortunately, Angela's case still remains unsolved. But do let me know your thoughts on that in the comments. Do you think that Jeffrey Willis had more victims? I personally think that it is very, very likely that he did, because of how very clearly planned and premeditated the attack on Jessica was. That suggests to me that perhaps it wasn't his first time, that he knew what he was doing because he had maybe done it before. And also he was like, what, 43 when he killed Jessica? It seems unlikely that someone as twisted and disturbed as him would wait that long to commit such a horrific crime. Hopefully if there are more victims of Jeffrey Willis out there, the connection will be made and justice will be served soon. But if not, maybe that's something that he will take to his grave. But yeah, that is it for this case. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case down below in the comments and also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Thank you all so so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!